Okay, we are live. Hey there, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Live video chat for Friday, March 22nd. And today, I'll be hanging out here for the next hour and basically having a conversation with you through the video chat window. So if there's anything that you would like to discuss with regards to building muscle, losing fat, any specific challenges that you may be dealing with when it comes to your workouts or your nutrition program, mindset, goal setting, all kinds of stuff, anything fitness and nutrition related, go ahead, post those questions and topics of discussion in our video chat window, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out over the next hour. Now, if you're new to the video chat, I want to welcome you. As this, this is a, a basically just a, a freestyle shooting off the cuff here, having a, a fun conversation back and forth. Uh, don't have a script. There's no real plan or, or reason to this other than just to connect and answer your questions live in real time. So again, if you're new to these video chats, I want to welcome you. Thanks for the support, and hopefully we'll get your questions answered and you get some value from this video chat today. All right, so I'm just going to jump right in. We've got several people joining us. And, okay, the regulars are letting me know it's coming through loud and clear, so I don't need to do my mic and audio video check because that's coming through. Thank you much. All right, let's uh, jump right in now. <clears throat> Get a sip. I'm drinking a turmeric and ginger tea. This is a new one that I picked up the other day, and I, I quite like it, actually. It kind of has a nice earthy taste to it so it's if i i'm i'm one of these people i like to experiment with different teas i mean i usually green tea is my staple tea of choice but i like to have other types of herbal tea from time to time especially experimenting with different types of uh, non-caffeinated teas and this one there's no caffeine in it but it's got a nice warming earthy taste to it so again it's a turmeric and ginger tea that i picked up and this one's a President's Choice brand of tea, if, if you're interested in checking it out for yourself. Not sponsored by the President's Choice. I'm just letting you know because I'm drinking. Somebody's going to probably ask, well, what are you drinking? So I'm answering the question before it gets asked. All right, moving on. Let's see. We have Sean is joining us. Say, what's up? Well, I'm here. Let's do it. We're ready to go. Uh, do you ever fear time? He says, getting older or do you not give a shit? Well, I won't say I don't give a shit. I mean, I certainly give a shit, but I don't know if fear is the right word to use. Um, hmm, it's an interesting question. I've never really been asked that before, um, but I'm proactive. I respect time more. And this is something I think the older you get, the more you're going to respect it and the more you're going to appreciate it because you realize you got less of it, right? And once you hit the big 4-0, then you're in the second half of life, right? I mean, like statistically, people don't live, well, I don't know what the, the average age is now, if it's in the high 70s or somewhere around there. I, I don't know what the, the current statistic was. I think the last one I heard was somewhere around 78 or whatever. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. But still, we're in the second half of life once you hit over 40. So it's... It's, it's a different mindset compared to when you're in your teenage years or even in your 20s when you got all that life ahead of you. Now you're looking at, shit, how much do I have left? <laughs> Not how much do I have ahead of me. How much do I have left? So I want to maximize what I got left. And that's why I'm more motivated than ever to really get myself in shape and not just in shape in terms of, you know, lifting heavy and, and than getting contest shredded or something like that, even though that's that's a cool perk, I mean, to, to be in shape and look like you're in shape, but to be healthy, that's my number one priority. That's what I'm really focusing on. So everything I do now is all, it's not just, is this going to, to help me in the gym in terms of looks and performance and whatever, but is this going to make me healthier? And that's my my main focus now. So it's, it's a different mindset shift uh, compared to when I was, younger and you know the and the competitive bodybuilding and powerlifting days you know sometimes doing the the dirty bulks in the off season just to try and gain the weight and lift heavier and stuff like that i mean that's what i don't really give a shit for anymore because i mean that's not my priority looking after my health and keeping myself uh, you know as fit as possible so that i can be around and active for as long as possible that's my goal right now but uh, an interesting perspective nonetheless thank you for uh, posting your question 
We've got uh, Stanley Stud joining us. He's asking, do I have a sister? <laughs> I have no siblings. I'm an only child. No siblings from me. Manuel's joining us. Maximilian's joining us. Ian is joining us. Woodulos is joining us. And Michael is joining us. All right, another question coming through. It says, I'm thinking about hopping on the juice. Do you have any tips? I want to become a freak, a beast, a plague upon mankind, a holy protein eater within the strength of ages, power over the lands and glory of. Wow. that's For those of you who are live right now, you can see this. This, this is word for word. I'm not making this up. Any tips about hopping on the juice? I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. I'll, I'll be totally honest. If you are seriously considering this, wait until you have a minimum, bare bones minimum of five plus years of progressive training under your belt naturally. Um, and, and that's, I'm not talking about like five years of on and off. I'm talking about five years of maximizing your progress naturally before you even consider it. Uh, I mean, I've seen some guys over the years, like they, as soon as they start working out, like within two weeks, they got a needle in their ass, right? You know, I mean, it's <laughs> right. Like there's no natural base. There's no foundation there whatsoever. So if like, first off, I mean, the obvious tip is, you know, stay natural and look after your health and do this for the health and fitness benefits. But if you're seriously going to do it, I mean, you're a big boy, you can do whatever the heck you want to do. Give yourself a minimum of a five years to maximize your natural base. Even the, the longer you can train naturally, the better it's going to be for you overall because you'll have a better foundation. You'll make better progress if you decide to, to go to the dark side, as they say. Uh, and it, ultimately, I think it will be the, the better solution. I think it's a mistake for people to start training and then automatically looking for a shortcut within, the mat, like within their first year of training to be starting to jump on, you know, performance enhancing drugs right off the bat. I think that's a mistake. Build the natural foundation first. And I think you'll be better off for it in the long run. All right. We have Jay Michael joining us for a hard gainer. Is isolation even worth it? So I'm assuming you mean like isolation exercises. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, it, first off, hard gainer. It, it It's just, like there's there's no such thing as a hard gainer, right? This is just a, a, a name that, that you know bodybuilders have, have come up with over the years. Everybody's a hard gainer unless you're a genetic freak, right? I mean, there now there are genetic freaks out there, and if if you want to see what they're they're the people who are gracing the pro bodybuilding stages. They're the ones who are on the magazine covers. I mean, those are the people who you know they just have that genetic structure. And they ha they have the ability to make gains faster than normal people, right? They are the elite of the elite. You know, the the, the tip of the iceberg, the, that top 1% or, or less, maybe even a percent of a percent. The rest of us are hard gainers, right? We got to work for it. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't work for it. I mean, even elite level bodybuilders still bust their ass. I mean, they work very hard, but they get more results for the work they put in, right? I mean, like prime example. I've been training since 1990. Most of the current pros who are on the, you know, the, the Olympia stage and stuff like that have been training maybe as long as I have or even less. And obviously, look, look at look at the gap, all right? I'm, I'm down here, they're up there, right? So I'm the hard gainer. I can't make those type of gains. And I'm not willing to do what they're willing to do in, in certain situations. Like we were talking about performance enhancing drugs. That's one thing, of course. but if, if you don't have the genetics, you just kind of have to accept it and realize, okay, that's, I don't have that hand of cards, if you will. I can't push myself to that limit, but I can do the best for me and in my situation. So getting back to your question, I mean, you're asking, you're considering yourself a hard gainer. First of all, get rid of that title. I mean, that, that's a stupid title. Everybody's a hard gainer. Everybody has to work for it. Nobody just, you know, goes into the gym and, and curls a few weights and all of a sudden like boom they're huge ripped and jack it takes work for everybody so you're, you're a hard gainer we're all hard gainers join the club and uh, now as far as isolation exercises absolutely they're worth it because you can't hit all your major muscle groups with compound movements alone i mean 
your bench presses, squats, and deadlifts, yeah, they cover the, the most of your major muscle groups, but there's a lot of other things that you want to train in there as well. You know, and this goes into even like machines and free weights. Are machines worth it? Yeah, because there are certain exercises you can't duplicate with free weights that you can do with machines. So I'm a believer in hitting the muscles from all angles, you know, looking at it from a complete development point of view. Yes, you want your heavy compound lifts. Yes, you want your isolation moves. Yes, you want your free weights. Yes, you want your machine. You want a well-rounded, well-balanced program. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do everything, every single workout. You can cycle through different phases. Like sometimes I'll go through phases where I'm primarily focusing on, you know, just heavy compound lifts to try and build a foundation. And then I'll go through other phases where I'm adding in more isolation exercises to kind of balance out any weak areas that I may have uh, developed from just focusing on the compound lifts. And this is something that you can train and, and, and cycle with your workouts over time. But you know, isolation exercises are just as important to a bodybuilding program. I mean, they, they do have their place. All right, moving on. We have Manuel joining us. He's asking, if I take four doses of branched-chain amino acids during the day, how long apart should I take them from each other? Thanks. Uh, first off, why do you want to take four doses of BCAs? That's, that's my question. Throughout the day, why not just have more protein throughout the day. That's, that's what I would do. I mean, I would rather, like, if, if you need to, first of all, zoom out, zoom out, look at the big picture. Don't be just, like, it's kind of like I can't see the forest for the trees, right? You, you know, you're, you're nitpicking on the details when you need to zoom out and look at the big picture. First off, are you consuming one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day? Yes or no, right? If you're doing that, that's going to cover most of your amino acid requirements. The only time you really want to take BCAs to over and above that is during hard training when your body is in this state of breaking down muscle tissue and you want to use the BCAs kind of like as an anti-catabolic, uh, basically a boost with your workouts. Because when you go into gym and you work out, you train hard, you're breaking down your muscle tissue. That's what... You know, you're not growing in the gym, you're tearing it down. You're breaking it down so that when you rest and recover and eat afterwards, your body builds itself up and comes back stronger the next time. And then you tear it down again and it recovers, becomes stronger, and you just repeat the process over and over. BCAs can help to aid with that tear, like maximizing your uh, recovery in, your, in the gym because it helps to provide some fast, rapidly absorbing amino acids that can be utilized for fuel rather than breaking down the muscle tissue and getting the amino acids from your lean muscle tissue, you can get them through the amino acid supplement that you're taking. And it helps to uh, give you some more energy, helps to preserve glycogen so you can actually train longer, train harder. And it helps with the whole anabolic rebuilding process. So personally, I don't see a point of taking BCAs throughout the day if you're consuming a high protein diet. So I would rather you eat real protein food throughout the day get your amino acids through that, and then the only time when you need that fast shot of amino acids, right, that nitrous boost of amino acids, if you will, is uh, during high-intensity workouts. That's when you should take your BCAs or, or EAAs, essential amino acids, either or, uh, to get the best benefit from them. But throughout the day, just regular high-protein food spaced out throughout the day. And making sure that you're meeting the minimum of one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Now, if, if you're overweight and you got a lot of extra weight, like, you know, a lot of extra fat, then you might want to go like one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight per day. But for, for someone who's trying to bulk up and gain size, I'd rather like err on the side of a little bit more. And that's why I go with one gram of protein per pound of total body weight for someone who's uh, skinny and trying to pack on size. All right, so next we have Mamalch is joining us. Uh, UD, UDUC full. <laughs> UDUCFUL, okay. Uh, Uda, Uda, Uda full? Uh, anyway, he says he's here and he's at work and he wouldn't miss this for the world. Well, I'm glad you're here. I hope you don't get in trouble at work. But thanks for the support. <laughs> All right. 
you're getting paid to watch this video chat. Good for you. Good for you. Um, you're, and who knows? <laughs> maybe, 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 you'll, maybe your boss wouldn't agree, but good for you. <laughs> Ian is joining us. He says a big shout out to President's Choice. All right, President's Choice tea it is, guys. Cheers. We have Moses is joining us. He says, Lee, your opinion on the box squat for massive growth on the squats. Uh, or he, he calls it the squads. I don't know if you meant to say squats or quads because you got an S there, but a massive growth on the quads as well as rack pulls uh, for the back and hamstrings. Thanks. Keep up the good work. All right. Box squats are not really a good exercise for isolating the quadriceps. I mean, the quadriceps will still come into play. You'll still feel your quads working, but it's not a true, as far as squat variations go, it's it's not one that's really going to isolate the quads. It's going to be more hips, more hamstrings. Uh, th that's what you're going to get more of with the box squat. That's going to be the, the prime movers. The quadriceps are going to be secondary. So if you want to focus on the quadriceps, uh, closer stance squats, Full squats, uh, probably like with your heels elevated, front squats, goblet squats, lunges, leg extensions. All these are really good exercises to isolate the quads. And if you want to really get more quad activation while you're squatting, pre-exhaust them first with leg extensions at the beginning of your workout. So then when you go into your squats afterwards, that's going to uh, you're going to get more muscle activation in the quads because they're already pre-exhausted. Um, prior to getting into the exercise. So that's a strategy that you can use as well. But as far as the box squat alone, it, it's it's not the ideal exercise for building massive quads. I mean, if, if you look at a lot of power lifters, sometimes you'll see guys who are big squatters, you know, big, big squatters, but they don't necessarily always have huge quads, right? They've got a big back, you know, they're probably th thick in the hamstrings, strong you know, hips and all this. I mean, they got a strong core, strong foundation, but not necessarily big, massive of quads, right? I mean, it's, it's usually people who do more of the, uh, like a, a, a full uh, front squat, like an Olympic lifter. They don't, they generally have better developed quadriceps than a power lifter because they're doing a lot of heavy front squats and heavy full range of motion, close stance squats. That's what really activates the quadriceps more so than the, the wide stance box squat. Uh, as far as the second part of your question, rack pulls for the back and hamstrings, yes, absolutely. And, and all deadlift variations are good for the back and hamstrings and rack pulls. That's just a, an advanced variation that's gonna allow you to handle even more weight. So that's that's definitely a good one. Okay, we have Blue Leaf joining us. Lee, what protein supplements would you recommend? How do you determine the accuracy of nutrition labels? Uh, you really have to go with, I guess, more of the more reputable brands if you want to. And even then, there's no guarantee when it comes to nutrition labels. I mean, there, there, there's bound to be some margin of error. And this doesn't just apply for protein. This applies for everything. Like if, if you buy uh, any packaged food in the grocery store and look at the nutrition label, that could be off by 25% easily. You know, that could be plus or minus 25% of what's on the label. And it's not necessarily that they're trying to scam you or anything like that. It's just due to very variations in the food. I mean, like, for example, I'll, I'll just give you something you can ponder at. Let's take a banana. Let's say, okay, how, how many calories and how much carbs, how much sugar is in a banana? Well, it depends how ripe is the banana. Because if you have a green banana, that's going to have a lot more starch, a lot less sugar, and the nutritional profile is going to be different compared to a ripe banana and compared to one that's actually starting to rot, you know, like is is turning brown, the, the peel is turning brown. So the nutritional value in this exact same food will vary depending on the stage that that food is at. So if it's if it's green, if it's yellow, or if it's starting to turn brown, you're going to get three totally different nutritional values in the exact same food. 
So that's just one example. Now you look at if you have uh, foods like a packaged item that has multiple ingredients included in there. And so you have multiple ingredients that could have multiple variables in their nutritional value. So what's on the label can easily vary up or down by about 25%. That's kind of like the, the, the rule of thumb. I mean, sometimes it's even off more than that, but bottom line, uh, for, for people who are just focusing on the counting macros and, and relying on those nutrition labels as if they're like, you know, the Bible or, or the, the, you know, 100% accurate in terms of the nutritional uh, intake that they're getting, they could be off, right? I mean, so sometimes, you know, people say, well, I'm, I'm following if it fits your macros and I'm eating, you know, X number of protein grams and carbs and fat and calories and this and that, and it's not working. Well, just because it says you're eating 100 calories on the label doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100 calories. It may be more, it may be less, you, you know, it's just a ballpark estimate. So um, where, where are we getting back to your question here now? <laughs> I've got, which protein supplement do I recommend and how do you trust nutrition labels? Okay. Um, so again, when it comes to nutrition labels, there, there's a margin of error. That's what I'm getting at. Now back to the protein supplements. Uh, I personally like to go with, with whey protein myself. I mean, that's usually my go-to protein supplements. I've tried some of the different ones, um, you know, and, and, you know, I personally like whey. First off, it's usually the most cost efficient of most protein supplements because it's in such demand now. I mean, back in the day, whey protein was way more expensive than it is now. I can remember going to the supplement store back in the early 90s and getting seeing a five pound container of optimum whey protein and they were charging somewhere like $90, 90, nine zero for a five pound container of whey back in the 80s or not the 80s in the 90s early 90s so i mean like it's now when you factor in inflation and the prices have gone down right so i mean it's it protein is cheaper now than it used to be because it's so readily available but when it wasn't readily available that stuff was expensive but i still was a big fan of whey protein uh, some brands like i i like to use optimum nutrition is one that i go for uh, sometimes I'll use um, Muscle Farm. I use that one, and, and quite honestly, the reason why I use them is because there's those are a couple brands that Costco carries, and I get the best deals on them. So I mean, it's a decent protein at a good price. So I mean, hey, why not? I go for it. Uh, another one that I've been using a lot lately, and it's it's kind of a different protein, but it's it's like a supplement to my protein supplement, if that makes sense. Uh, but that's collagen. I'm using collagen because it has totally different uh, nutritional profile compared to most protein. I mean, we usually take protein for the amino acids and, and the, the muscle building benefits, but collagen is good for the joint and bone building benefits and, and the skin and the connective tissue and all this kind of stuff. So collagen has its own, it, it's a unique protein that has entirely different uh, benefits and that can definitely help not only for your overall health and fitness, but uh, for your muscle building as well. Because if you have strong joints, strong connective tissue, that's going to help you in the gym. And I mean, it's 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 only been a few months since I really started supplementing with collagen. But like, a knock on wood, I, I feel that my joints are are feeling strong and healthy. And I think it's a direct relation to uh, regularly supplementing with collagen. All right, so let's move on. Hopefully that answered your question. I know I went on a bit of a ramble there, but it's sometimes when you go on a, a bit of a ramble like that, you actually get some good quality content because I'm sure some people probably didn't know that there's, you know, a margin of error on all nutrition labels. Like just take it with a grain of salt. It's not gospel, right? It's and that's just the way it is. That's they're not scamming you. They're not being unethical. It's just that's the the nature of food. I mean, food varies in its nutritional value. And the labels can be way off. All right, Anthony is joining us. Uh, have you ever paid for personal training and coaching, or you just try to figure things out on your own along the way? <laughs> I have hired a lot of coaches, and I've done a lot of study and, and courses and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I've I've definitely invested in my personal training and in my education, and I continue to do so. I, I spend a, a fair chunk of money in, in coaching. I mean, that's something that I do on an ongoing basis. And when I started, 
I, I tried to do it on my own. And, you know, I got some help from friends and family members who, who worked out and they kind of helped get me started. But uh, within my early years of bodybuilding, when I started to actually do pretty good in competition, I hired a coach. And I found that when you're working with a coach, uh, it's, it can really take things to another level. Because now it's not just you trying to figure everything out, but you have someone that you can bounce ideas off and strategize with. And you got a set of outside eyes looking at your progress. Someone who's not emotionally attached and who can give you some rational direction. Because sometimes when we're focusing on our, our own progress and our own goals and we're emotionally attached to it, we can't make rational decisions or, or sometimes we can't see because we just don't know. Like we, we, you know, you might get stuck in a plateau and, and you're beating your head against the wall all frustrated and a coach who's got more experience and more knowledge might say, hey, you know, just back off a little bit and change things up a little. And then all of a sudden, boom, you, you're past that plateau and making progress again. So, yeah, I've I've hired a lot of coaches over the years and I still continue to hire coaches. I'm working with coaches right now. All right. Anthony's got a question. Oh, that was the question. Sorry. Uh, Sean's got a question. Um, he says he got cut off. OK. I'll say it again. All right. Well, Sean, go ahead. And repost your question if it didn't come through the first time. OK, let's see what else we got. Ian is asking. Any tips for relieving hip flexor soreness post-workout? Stretching would be a huge one. Uh, hot and cold water therapy is another one that can definitely help. But uh, stretching and light activity, walking, getting outside for regular walks. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Uh, frequent walks throughout the day. Uh, I'll tell you something that I've been doing uh, a lot lately, and I find that it's, it's helped. And that is 10-minute walks. If, if those of you who follow Stan Efforting on YouTube, you've probably seen his videos on 10 minute walks. And, you know, I've, I've watched several of Stan's videos and I really like the guy. I mean, he's, he's very knowledgeable and I have a lot of respect for him because here's a man in his 50s and he looks phenomenal, right? So, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for him, but he's got a video about the 10 minute walk. And I started, you know, I, I've, I've seen it. And I decided to implement it myself. And I did, you know, read up on some of the studies behind the, the science of a 10-minute walk. And it makes a lot of sense. And I've been doing them myself for uh, the past while. And I, I enjoy it. I find that it's, it's, it really helps with your recovery. It helps with your energy levels, with your digestion, your metabolism. And the, the idea of a 10-minute walk is you're going, instead of doing, like, let's say you're going to do an hour of cardio. Right. You know, you go and do an hour walking. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it gets it can sometimes get a bit monotonous or sometimes people will put it off because they think, well, I, you know, I've got to have a full hour in order to go for a walk or whatever. But a 10 minute walk like you can squeeze that in anywhere. You can squeeze it in on your lunch break. You can squeeze it in before work, after work, you know, on a break time, anytime you can squeeze in a 10 minute walk. So throughout the day multiple 10 minute walks so for, for example instead of doing 30 minutes of cardio in one bout go for three 10 minute walks throughout the day you know ideally do one after every meal and walking after a meal has actually been shown to help aid with the digestion and the the utilization of the food you just ate like it helps to shuttle that food into your system and into the muscle cells and there was actually a study done i, I could probably dig it up or, or you can just probably search it for yourself on Google, you know, 10 minute walk study or something like that. But doing these regular 10 minute walks after meals has been shown to be twice as effective as taking metformin, which is the, the diabetic drug, which helps to uh, uh, shuttle, you know, glucose into the muscle cells. You know, a lot of people who are diabetic, but not to the stage where they need insulin yet, they often take metformin. Now, I, I may be mispronouncing the name, but I those of you who know what I'm talking about, you, you'll recognize it. Uh, but going for 10-minute walks post-meal has been shown to be twice as effective as the diabetic drug. So it's natural. It's healthy. You know, I mean, there's no no side effects to a 10-minute walk. So, I mean, it's something that I've been doing myself, and uh, I would definitely recommend it for not only helping with fat loss and, and aiding with your digestion, but aiding with delayed onset muscle soreness, because every time you get out and move those muscles, circulate the blood flow, you're helping to uh, uh, work 
the, those sore muscles get, you know, just to stretch them and give them that light bit of exercise. And walking is a great way to get exercise throughout the hip flexors and stuff. And I think that'll help to speed up your recovery. So regular stretching, regular walking. And if you want, uh, when you get your showers, try the hot and water, hot and cold water therapy. And if you want more information about that, rather than taking up time through this video chat, just do a, a search for uh, Lee Hayward, how to get rid of muscle soreness. I've got a video that explains this. All right, Michael is saying, do you have to gain weight to gain muscle? I'm currently 161 pounds. I have 265 pounds bench press. I was wondering, is it possible to get to a 285 bench press while maintaining the same weight? Yes, absolutely, it is possible. Um, but from a practical point of view, it's easier to get stronger as you gain body weight. It will be easier. Uh, th there's no magic number, like there, but a, a ballpark estimate is for every five pounds of body weight you gain, you'll probably put 10 pounds on your bench press, assuming you're training consistently and everything else. Like a lot of powerlifters, this, this ratio I heard from competitive powerlifters, a lot of them say if they go up in body weight by about five pounds, it's very common to put about 10 pounds on your bench press. So. Uh, if you if you want the, the fastest way to get stronger is to also get bigger, right? The bigger you are, the stronger you are. I mean, the more mass you're going to have uh, to get behind the weights and to power them up. So you can definitely do it. Uh, but if you want to stay lean and increase your strength, and, and then, yeah, you can do it that way. But it is a, a slower process, right? Because you don't have the, the mass behind the, to, to power up the heavy weights. But you see this all the time, like a lot of powerlifters who are competing in weight classes, they purposely keep their weight low, uh, you know, because they want to compete in, a, you know, a certain weight class. And, but they're still training for strength, still training to get uh, stronger while staying within their desired weight class. So, yeah, it is possible, but it's just a slower process. Okie dokie. All right, we have uh, Allie's joining us. Why are powerlifters so jacked even if they don't train for size? Uh, well, it depends on the powerlifter. I mean, like a lot of times if, if, if you're looking at powerlifters and you're like looking at like professional and elite level powerlifters and stuff like that, I mean, yeah, those guys are going to look jacked because they're elite level powerlifters. You go to an average local powerlifting meet, not everybody's going to look, you know, huge and jacked. Some will, but but not everybody. You know, some are going to look like just average people, right? I mean, they're, they're not just because you're a power lifter doesn't automatically make you huge and jacked. Um, but with that being said, powerlifting provides a great base because people who've been powerlifting for years and have built that base, that foundation, you know, the, the thick pecs from heavy benching, the thick back from heavy deadlifting, you know, big legs from heavy squatting and all the assistant exercises they do. That lays the foundation for a big physique. You know, power lifters have a different mindset than bodybuilders. Like a lot of people think who are ignorant to the sports think, well, it's all weightlifting. It's all the same, right? You know, you're, you're, you're a bodybuilder, you're a power lifter. It's all the same. No, it's not. <laughs> There's two, like, it's, it's like trying to say, uh, a soccer player and a basketball player is the, is the same, right? Because you, both sports you're playing with a ball. No, I mean, there's two totally different sports, two totally different you know, objectives and rules and everything else. So, you know, it's like chalk and cheese. But power lifters use their muscles to lift maximum weight. Bodybuilders use the weights to build maximum muscle. So it's there's a lot of similarity and there's going to be a lot of carryover, yes, because your you know your muscles and, and weights are involved in both cases but it's how you're using your muscles to lift the weights versus how you're using the weights to build the muscles you know bodybuilders tend to focus more on slower tempo more time under tension focusing on getting that muscular contraction focusing on the pump and all that whereas powerlifters are just simply trying to move the weight from point a to point b but even when you're moving a lot of weight from point A to point B and you're doing it so repetitively for years on end, you're going to build a lot of muscle in the process. And some of the world's best bodybuilders got their start in powerlifting. 
I mean, former Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman, he was a power lifter before he was ever a bodybuilder. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger used to be a power lifter back in the day. Now, I don't know why he started first, whether it was bodybuilding or powerlifting, but he did his fair share of powerlifting back in the day. Uh, Tom Platts did powerlifting. Uh, Branch Warren did powerlifting. Johnny Jackson did powerlifting. I mean, a lot of the guys did powerlifting. And, you know, Stan Efferding did powerlifting. I mean, a lot of them have done powerlifting as well as bodybuilding. But, you know, powerlifting builds a, a good foundation, a good base. All right, moving on, we have uh, Amir's joining us. He says, I have a question about niacin supplements for 40-year-old men uh, to help reduce cholesterol. Have you tried it? What's the difference between flush and non-flush? Okay, good question. Niacin is a B vitamin supplement. I think, uh, I think it's vitamin B3. I think. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's vitamin B3. Uh, so... I personally don't take a pure isolated niacin supplement, but I do take a B vitamin complex, which has all the, the, the B vitamins in it. And I take that on a regular basis. That's one of my must have supplements is the B complex. I usually take it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. Uh, so I am supplementing with niacin indirectly through there because it's part of the complex, but I don't like to take pure niacin. Niacin is a, uh, is a tricky supplement because if you, if you take high amounts of pure niacin, it flushes your body. And, and ironically, where, where you feel a lot of the flushing is from the neck up in, in your head. Like I remember the uh, back up now, the bodybuilders back in the day and some bodybuilders even today still use niacin as a, a pre-contest uh, pump up. So like when they're backstage getting ready to, to pump up and go on stage, they'll sometimes take niacin because it has this flushing effect. It helps to increase blood flow. Uh, now, how your body responds to it is, is individual. Like I know some people take it and they love it. And they find it makes them, you know, get a better pump, get more vascular and everything else. Some people take it and it doesn't have much of a, an impact at all. Other people take it and it makes them feel like stomach sick and headaches and whatever. Uh, but one of the common things is it makes your face just like a blood red tomato. Like, I mean, it just, it, and that's what happened to me. First time I ever took niacin, my face just went blood red and I actually got sick to my stomach. I mean, I puked my guts up from it, right? I mean, I took a 500 milligram tablet of niacin, which is a hefty dose of niacin. And face, blood red, I started to itch all over, just like this itchy, crawly sensation. And I mean, I was just, couldn't even sit still. I was just so agitated from the itchiness and the irritation. And then within about a half hour, I just bleh, puked it all up and actually felt much better after I puked it up. So my body kind of rejected the high dose of niacin. Uh, and now the non-flush, again, I, I need to look this up because I don't know the exact chemical differences but basically the flush version will cause that you'll get that flushing the itchiness the the red skin and all that that's the flush the non-flush is supposedly a form of niacin that doesn't cause that so again I, I don't know chemically what they do to make it different i'd have to look that up to see what it is but i find that in the small amount that i'm getting in my b complex supplement i don't experience any of those side effects and i'm still able to get the nutritional benefits of regular niacin supplementation so if you are going to use pure niacin start off with a small amount like whatever the smallest dose you can find at your supplement store you know go with that don't jump to the big 500 milligram tablets uh, like i did because it, it was just way too much right so i mean start off small and uh, from a you know, from a health point of view, you probably don't even need the pure one. Even the, a B complex supplement like I'm using is probably going to be more than enough to uh, get the, the health benefits because it's it's not something that you need to overdose on in one shot. I mean, it's something you want to take on a regular basis, you know, as a long term supplement. And you can probably hear my son out there running around having fun. So if you do hear a baby squealing and laughing and giggling in the background, everything's okay. He's just playing and doing his thing. All right, Mark is joining us. B Victorious is joining us. 
uh, be victorious. Is should powerlifters concentrate only on the big three lifts? No, powerlifters need to do assistant exercises to develop a well balanced physique as well. If you only do, excuse me, if you only do bench, squat, and deadlift, you're leaving a lot of muscle groups out, right? You want to focus on bringing up all your major muscle groups and train them in balance and proportion so that not only are you stronger, but you prevent injury. So if a well-balanced powerlifting program will include exercises for all the major muscle groups and special exercises to bring up the weak points that powerlifters need to help stabilize themselves when they're doing their lifts. So you can go through a phase of just doing three lifts only but again that would be a short-term phase but over the long term of your training cycle you know or, or over the course of the year you're going to have to do some work to bring up your weak points or, or else you're going to have some some imbalances and potential future injuries when it comes to powerlifting one of the, the programs that i've used in the past like back in the early 2000s mid 2000s that's when i was really focusing on powerlifting and I followed a lot of different programs, and one program that I really took a liking to was the West Side Barbell style of training, and I ordered all the DVD, or they weren't DVDs back then, all the VHS tapes, right? This is old school, right? All Louis Simmons VHS tapes, the West Side Secrets uh, tapes, and I ordered a bunch, uh, like all Dave Tate's seminar videos and stuff like that now Dave Tate did have some that came out on DVD later but the old original ones you know the, the old school ones came out on VHS tapes and I watched those over and over and over and over again and uh, I mean even back oh geez years ago down in Columbus Ohio and I actually met Louis Simmons and I met Dave Tate I mean that was back back in 2007 it was so it's a long time ago now and uh, but yeah I really really dove in to studying West Side Barbell and every bit of you know literature I could get on it. I studied it and I followed it. And I found that it was one of the more complete powerlifting programs because they really emphasized well-balanced training, doing a lot of assistant exercises and special exercises to help bring up the power lifts. Not just you know squatting, benching, and deadlifting, but a lot of different exercises. And I found that it made me stronger all over. And it also helped me to put on a lot of muscle mass because ironically, after going through that style of training, that's when I was started to really make some progress in bodybuilding as well. So like I said before, powerlifting can have a good foundation to help with bodybuilding. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, if you are looking for a powerlifting program to follow, I would recommend looking into the West Side Barbell. Uh, Dave Tate has a good YouTube channel, uh, Elite FTS. That's kind of like the, the, the new you know 2.0 version of west side because west side was just a little hole in the wall gym in columbus ohio and dave has really you know made it more mainstream with with his youtube channel and, and much bigger training facility and stuff but definitely the, those guys i mean that's hard hardcore i mean <laughs> the hardest of the hardcore but it's stuff that it really works and if, if you want to look into some serious powerlifting uh, training i would recommend it all right, moving on. Forge in Fashion is joining us. We have uh, another question here from you, U U Udo, Udo Sufel, <laughs> I think it's the username. He says, anyone care for aesthetics as far as looks go? The power lifters I've seen are not attractive. Okay, you're probably just commenting to someone else's uh, question. Charlie's joining us. <laughs> All right, this is a weird question, but I'll answer it anyway. Why not? Sean is saying, Lee, this isn't a fitness-related question, but if you could be any animal for a day, what would it be? Uh, I'd be a great white shark and eat people at the beach. <laughs> to stay anabolic. Okay. Any animal for a day. I would be a bird. I'd like to fly. Right, like an eagle or a condor or something like that. But I would love to be able to fly. Wouldn't that be cool? Right, just spread your wings and just fly. Especially like a, you know, more extreme, like an eagle, you know, condor, something like that. Some of these big ass birds that can fly and go, you know, super crazy fast. Yeah, 
that's probably what I would be. If I could be an animal for a day, I would I would fly like a bird. <laughs> All right, we have Crush Crazy saying, do you even lift, bro? I'm trying to quit. Man, I'm trying to quit. It's a bad habit. I got this lifting stuff. Uh, Charlie saying, well, Charlie's joining us. We have Jesse is joining us. Um, Jesse's asking about how collagen is working. I actually mentioned that earlier in the video chat, and it's working quite well. Um, Steve is joining us. He says he's an avid cyclist. Avid cyclist with well-developed glutes, just starting with the leg press and leg extensions. Can't squat due to shoulder tightness. What's your opinion on training while still sore? Okay. I can't squat due to shoulder tightness. Well, one thing I would recommend, and this is something that I think is quite common among cyclists, uh, shoulder tightness. And I think it's the prolonged time you're spending riding hunched over. I mean, if it's a road bike and everything else. I mean, if you if you look at a road cyclist, I mean, nothing against cycling because I, I love cycling. I mean, I'm, I'm more into mountain biking myself, but I love cycling. It's, it's fun. I've been, you know, ever since I was a kid and got my first bicycle, I've been hooked on bike riding. But if you look at a road cyclist, they have terrible posture. Like the look at the back, how the back is all rounded and they're hunched over and they're like that for prolonged periods of time. I mean, a road cyclist can be like that for a long time and that awkward bent over posture. And it can create a lot of tightness in, in you know, imbalances in the shoulders. Because I actually was coaching a cyclist not too long ago. It was, well, it was, I don't know, six months ago or something. He signed up for one of my one-on-one -on -one coaching because he needed some help with his nutrition program and, of course, to work around some uh, mobility issues that he had. And one of them was the shoulders. And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that this is probably a common thing. And this this guy was doing crazy amounts of, of cycling, like nuts. I mean, it was like 50 kilometers a day was like an average day, right, for him. So he's putting in crazy hours on the bike. And, uh, and had a lot of shoulder issues. So I had to really help him you know, with some exercises to rehab and, and to strengthen and build up his shoulders, especially a lot of work for the rear delts because those are just you know, not getting worked at all, totally neglected. So that's something that you might want to definitely look into, a lot of shoulder mobility uh, exercises. And I have some, some videos posted about this on my YouTube channel, just type in like Lee Hayward you know, shoulder exercises, Lee Hayward rotator cuff exercises stuff like that. I actually have a new video in the works, one that I shot when I was down in Florida training at Critical Bench, a new shoulder uh, mobility uh, workout coming through. Or it's, ex it's not necessarily a workout, but it's shoulder mobility exercises and warm-up exercises that you can do prior to your workouts. That's a new video that's in the works. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to focus on that so that you can strengthen the shoulders so that you can do exercises like squats and that you can have full mobility. Because I mean, if, if you have these mobility issues, that's hindering you. I mean, that's and it's not going to get better on its own, right? You need to take some positive action on your own part to fix it. As far as training while sore, it really depends. Sometimes if you're doing a low-intensity active recovery type of workout, that is the way to get past the soreness. But I wouldn't recommend doing some heavy, high-intensity uh, workout while still sore. I mean, you're, you're not going to set personal record in the gym while you're still sore. You need to be fully recovered for that. But you can do some light mobility exercises, like active recovery work, uh, and just try and get more blood flow into the muscles. So light exercises, more isolation work, higher repetitions, uh, basically just pumping and flushing the muscles, along with stretching. Uh, that's a great way to, uh, to help rid yourself of, of soreness. And also doing some low-intensity cardio. That's a great way to uh, you know flush out. Like if your legs are sore, maybe you did a, a you know one killer bike ride, and now your legs are sore. Just do some light, easy exercise. Maybe even just going for a walk, stuff like that, just to get some mobility and some blood flow throughout the body, without placing a lot of excess strain on the on the muscles. So active recovery. So that's the type of training you should do while you're sore. Uh, another question here, this one's from Heath, asking, does a massage help with recovery? It can. Uh, there's different types of massages from a, just a relaxation massage to a deep tissue massage, but uh, it, it definitely can help to improve blood flow and, and recovery. I personally haven't done a lot of massage work. I have 
done a little bit over the years, but it's, it's not a regular part of my training. Uh, but I know like a lot of guys do it as a regular part. Like remember uh, hearing about like Jay Cutler back when he was training for the Olympia, he used to like regularly do a lot of massage work. I mean, deep tissue massage and stuff like that. And he was spending a, a fortune on it actually. I mean, it's, that's what blew me away. I think he said he was averaging like a thousand dollars a week on massages. So I mean, like basically, you know, an average person's salary is what he would spend per week just on getting massages. So it was a, uh, it was pretty crazy, but yeah, I mean, it definitely can help. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, Heath. Uh, okay. Uh, Sabar is joining us. He says, Lee, is there a difference in 50 and over? Okay. I, I do a lot of videos talking about, you know, 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 plus, whatever. I mean, I've just turned 40. So, I mean, a lot of my videos, I put that title in there, you know, training for men over 40 or nutrition for men over 40. And the body does change. I mean, the older you get, it does change. I mean, I can remember when I was a teenager, the, what I could get away with in terms of training and nutrition was was absurd, right? I mean, you could eat, you know, the, didn't have to stick to a strict diet and I could still get lean, right? I could train like a madman, use crappy form and I didn't get injured. As I got a bit older, it changed, right? So, I mean, you know, and then as you get a bit older again, like, I'll give you an example. Like from a training point of view, this is the way it kind of worked. Um, when I was younger, you know, there was no such thing as injuries, right? I mean, I just trained like a mad man in the gym and, and could recover from it, could handle it, whatever, no problem. As I got into my 20s, needed to pay a bit more attention to it. I was getting a few aches and pains here and there, but nothing serious. Uh, when I was 28, that's when I suffered my first muscle tear. Then I needed to be really cautious of my training actually do proper warm-ups and really emphasize that as i got into my 30s you know more tendonitis and aches and pains started to creep up so that even more emphasis on warm-up and mobility and that now in my 40s even more so again right and i'm sure as i get into my 50s 60s and beyond it's just going to be even more right you really have to pay attention to uh, more respectful of your body you know, not pushing the limits and not just abusing it and trying to, you know, train as hard as you can and like, beat yourself up when you go to the gym. Like when I was younger, I used to train to the point where I, like, you know, no pain, no gain. And then the idea of just training for hours on end and multiple sets to failure for, you know, every exercise, it just, you can't abuse your body to the same degree the older you get. And like say in the forties, fifties and sixties and whatever, it's, it's just going to become more so. So the, you just have to be more respectful. As far as the nutrition is concerned, you have to pay more attention to quality because obviously it's going to get a lot easier to get fatter as your metabolism slows down, your hormones slow down, you know, it start to decline, I should say. Uh, so you want to pay, pay more attention to quality nutrition and, uh, you know, you can't get away with the, the junk food like you can when you're younger. So eating cleaner, lifting smarter, more respectful of your body, paying more attention to mobility, warming up, stretching, recovery, all that kind of stuff. So that that's where the, the change is. That's the difference as you get older. It's not that you can't train. I mean, you can still train. You can still make progress and all that. But you just have to be uh, a lot more respectful and, and focus on all these details that you sometimes see the young guys just kind of ignore or brush over. I mean, I, I've seen teenagers walk in off the street, you know, totally cold walk over and slap like two plates on the bench press and start you know lifting i'm like man oh man like that's an injury waiting to happen i mean you can get away with it now but you know it's going to catch up with you you know it's just a matter of time all right let's move on and see what else we got uh okay we have We have G. Sidhu joining us. He says he's five foot nine, 105 pounds, and he wants to start lifting. Any tips? Yes. Start now. Don't wait. Start now. <laughs> the, you know, the, the best time to work out was like 10 years ago. The second best time to start working out is right now. So if you want to start, don't think about it. Don't delay it. Just start right now. Don't make it complicated. You know, Jump in and figure out the details as you go. That's my best advice. 
I mean, I've got a lot of videos on YouTube. I've got eBooks that you can download. If you, you know, there, there's there's tons of information. Like you can't use I don't know what to do as an excuse anymore because there is more information available now than ever before. So just start now. I mean, I've got a basic beginner's workout program posted up on YouTube. It's right on my main channel page. Take that, go to the gym, and get to it. Boom. Do that three days a week. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, your, your workout program 101. Start now. Figure out the details as you go. The, the biggest mistake that a lot of people make uh, when they're beginning a program or they – they overthink it. They, they make it too complicated. They make it this big, massive project in their mind. Like they're thinking, well, I got to get the right program. And then I need to get the right diet. And, oh, and then I need to get the right supplements. And well, what do I take before my workout, during my workout, after my workout? And oh, I need to, you know, well, what about recovery? What do I do on my off days? And blah, 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 blah. Who gives about, who cares about all that shit? Just, just start working out, right? Like keep it simple. Just go to the gym. Start with step one. Go to the gym. And you'll gradually be able to piece together all this other nitty gritty details as as you go. I mean, most of it is not nearly as important as you're making it out to be in your mind anyway. Like most people are getting paralysis by analysis. They're just getting caught up in the details and they're so overwhelmed and thinking too much that they don't do anything. So stop thinking and start doing. So if you want to start working out, this is my tip for you. Just pick a program and I'm going to give you the program. Go Look for Lee Hayward's Total Body Workout for Beginners. It's on YouTube. You can watch that video. You can even open up the description, copy and paste all the exercises, you know, or write them down in the notebook so you got a list of them, and go to the gym and start doing it. Boom. That's Workout 101 right there. All right, let's move on. Um, wait, how are these? A lot of the questions coming through here and now are just conversation back and forth, which is fine. So I'm just going to look, see if there's a question directed towards me personally. Uh, Uh, let's see what else we got. Just give me a second, guys. I'm just reading through the comments here now. Again, there's a lot of chit chat back and forth, which is totally cool. But I wanted to see what's directed towards me as far as a, a question for our video chats. We're almost done now, so I'm just going to take another question or two and include it up for the day. All right, here's a, a question I'll throw out there. Uh, why, this is from Azim. Azim is a regular to our video chats. He's, man, I, I don't think he misses many, if, if, if any. <laughs> I always see his, his comments come through every chat. So again, yeah, thanks for the support. Uh, why do competitive bodybuilders need to tan in order to compete? How much bodybuilders stay under the sun to tan? Bodybuilders probably do a bit of sun tanning. I mean, most of them do, whether it's natural sun tan or tanning beds. More often than not, it's probably going to be tanning beds. But the dark color that you see a competitive bodybuilder uh, on stage with, that's not achieved through sun tan. That is a paint on tan that they apply before the competition. That is artificial tan, paint on, and, and it's, it's temporary, right? So you cannot physically get dark enough through sun tan alone to compete on the bodybuilding stage under those bright lights and look dark, right? Uh, to put it in perspective, even black people have to put on this paint on tan in order to get on stage and compete. I remember one of the competitions that I was at, I, I wasn't actually competing this year. I was volunteering backstage and helping people out. And we had a, a guy competing. He was a black man in great shape too. I mean, he was a heavyweight competitor, you know, big, full muscle bellies. I mean, just, looked phenomenal, right? You know, like really good, good shape. And I said, you know, are, are you going to put on some tan? And it, he, he's done a few shows over the years, but he, he's kind of like on and off with competing. He wasn't, wasn't really serious about it, even though like he had the genetics to, to take it, you know, to probably like the national level if he wanted to. 
But, you know, he showed up and he said, no, nah, I'm not going to bother with tan. He said, I'll put on a little bit of oil. That's all. And I said, you know, like, you really should put on some tan, right? I mean, it'll make you look better on stage under the lights. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And couldn't convince him. I said, all right, hey, do what you want to do, right? It's up to you. He got out on stage. It was him and four other white guys. And the white guys were darker than he was on stage because they had put on the proper tan. I mean, he was the whitest guy on stage, right? And, and the reason for this is because the darker your skin tone, the more it's going to highlight your muscle definition under those bright contest lights. And that's why bodybuilders do it. And you need to be super dark. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous how dark you need to be. I mean, for people who are not familiar with competitive bodybuilding, you don't realize how dark. Like some people think, oh, I, I got a nice suntan from, you know, spending all the time out in the summer and blah, 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 the natural sunlight. No, no, no. That, that's not dark enough. You need to be blacker than a black person, right? You know, that, that's what the level of darkness that you need to have. And uh, the only way to get that is through these paint on tans. Uh, like pro tan is a common one. Um, you know, Dream Tan is another one that I used to use, Jan Tana, but there, there, there's so many different companies now making tan, I, I can't even list them all off, but it's more or less just a paint on tan, and it's, it's, it's a requirement for competitive bodybuilders. All right, moving on, let's see what else we got. Um, all right, we have Steve joining us. He says, greetings from a newfie living in Alberta. Hey, Steve, welcome to the show. Glad you're joining in. All right. Idris, I think that's how you pronounce your name, says, do high reps, are they good for vascularity and do they allow you to get veins on the muscles? All right. This whole idea, like high, high repetitions, it's, it's not necessarily going to make you more vascular. What's going to make you more vascular is losing body fat. The leaner and thinner your skin is, the more you're going to see the muscle definition and the veins underneath. And then a lot of that still has to do with your just your genetics. Like some bodybuilders have a lot of natural vascularity in, in certain body parts. Like, for example, in my case, I have a lot of vascularity throughout my chest. Like when I get lean and pumped up, and flex you can see the veins come out in my chest and my shoulders and stuff like that I have a lot of natural vascularity there uh, if you want to see an example of uh, well i'm not even going to look for a picture now but uh even now in the conditioning that i'm in now i mean i can still see some vascularity in my chest and like my recent shoulder workout video i did a at the end of that video i was doing some posing after the workout and you could even see that the vascularity throughout my shoulders and chest you know especially when you're pumped up post-workout um, but some bodybuilders, despite the fact that they get super lean, don't have a lot of vascularity. And I'll give you a, an example, like former Mr. Olympia, Jay Cutler. I mean, even when he was in Olympia shape, winning the competition as the best bodybuilder in the world, I mean, yes, he had some vascularity, but it wasn't extreme. It wasn't like crazy veins running through him. In fact, he act actually looked kind of uh, smooth in terms of vascularity because there just wasn't a lot of veins. But then you have other bodybuilders, like, I mean, back in the day, for those of you who've been around bodybuilding for a while, may remember Paul Dillette. Paul Dillette had the most insane vascularity of, of any bodybuilder that I've seen, especially, you know, the chest and the arms. It was just, it was crazy. And uh, again, that, that's genetics, right? You, you, you can't, you can't do anything to change that, you know, or whatever. I mean, the leaner you get, the more muscle you get, and the more pumped you get, that's going to help to enhance it. But it's, it's you know, you, you can't physically change the way your, your vascularity is. You know, it's something like you either have it or you don't. Once you're at a, a low enough body fat, that is. So, like, high reps, low reps, you know, it, it's it's not really going to make a difference. You know, I mean, you see some powerlifters. Some powerlifters are crazy vascular. Some are, are not. You know, it's, so the, no, the number of repetitions really doesn't have a, an impact on that. It's it's your level of body fat, and then it's your genetics. All right, let's move. Tell you what, guys, that was pretty good. I'm going to clue up. Um, all right, uh, one more question there. I'm going to answer this one. This is from Steve, who's the newfie from, the newfie living in Alberta. 
says that he was plan he's planning on visiting Venice this summer, Venice, California, asking if I've ever been there. Yes, I have been there a few times. Uh, the last time I was there was 2009, I think it was, right? Uh, but it, it's cool. It's cool to go there, you know, to see Muscle Beach and to train there. Now, you got to realize, like, the Muscle Beach that's there now, it's not the original Muscle Beach. The original Muscle Beach was down in Santa Monica. Uh, the one that's there, there now is in uh, Venice, California. Uh, but, obviously, it's, it's a much better gym. I mean, it's actually a pretty good equipped gym with, with all the, you know, the major equipment that you need. Uh, but it's it's cool to be there, you know, just to experience it all. And so I did the whole bodybuilding thing. I went to, you know, train at Gold's, or tra sorry, trained at Muscle Beach several times. And also trained at Gold's Venice. Um, that was, at the time, that was the most insane gym that I've ever been in. And I'm sure, it, 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 you know, that's over 10 years ago now. So I'm sure it's, it's even better nowadays. But that place, it was like you walk into... The, the main area and it's like every piece of equipment that you can think of from it's like one brand maybe like hammer strength for example and then of course free weights and everything else and then you go into the next section and it was like every piece of equipment that you could think of from another brand maybe it was like fitness and then another brand so it was like each section of the gym was like a whole complete gym in and of itself like i mean it was crazy it was just and then they had a whole outdoor section there where they had you know, guys doing some outdoor training with tires and, and some, you know, kettlebells and all kinds of stuff. So it was cool, I got to say. And it's quite the experience just to, to be there and I mean, seeing a lot of the, the different pros. I mean, when I was there, like Charles Glass was there, uh, you know, a lot of the old school guys, just to see him training. I mean, it was pretty cool, you know, especially for a, a bodybuilding fan. And uh, then afterwards, went to the firehouse for my, you know, post-workout bodybuilding meal, which is you know, like whatever it was, like plain chicken and rice or something like that. But I mean, it's just a plain, it's still a boring meal. But still, like they, they've got on their menu, like plain, boring bodybuilding, bro foods, right? Right there on the menu and you could order it there. So it was pretty cool to, to just do the whole uh, bodybuilding experience down in uh, California. So I enjoyed that one. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to do it again. Um, and you're asking, uh, do I know Frank McGraw? Yeah, I, I know Frank. I mean, uh, myself and Frank... Uh, I mean, we, we've competed together back on the Newfoundland stage back when Frank was living here in Newfoundland. Uh, so, yeah, I know Frank. I, w I wasn't b big friends with him, but, I mean, I knew him through the bodybuilding scene. Uh, Callum, I've never met Callum before. I've seen him on videos and stuff, but I've never met him in person. But I do know Frank. But, again, it's been years since I've seen him. All right, so there's a little trip down memory lane. And another little thing, someone... I just seen posted up. Someone did a, a sponsored post there through the uh, super chat. So thank you for that. That was John Too Fine. So just want to say thanks for your videos and app. They've really helped me get in shape. I'm not at my goal yet, but I am getting there. Well, thank you for your your sponsored post there. I do appreciate it and appreciate the support. And if you do need any help, right? You've got the app. Send me a private message through the app within the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app. Where is it? I've got my phone here. I'll get it out for you real quick. For those of you who haven't got a copy of Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding app, go ahead and download it. It is available for both Apple as well as Android devices, and you can get it right on my website. Just go to leehayward.com, and you'll see a link to the app right there on my website. And here's where I share some of my best workout programs. There's workout programs there for beginners, for intermediate, for advanced. You know, there's different types of upper lower body splits, um, push-pull workouts, body weight workouts, five by five, uh, different tips for pre-workout pre warm-up, post-workout stretching, blah, blah, blah. I mean, uh, basically, I, I really try to over-deliver and provide a lot of value here. Uh, there's a whole exercise database where you can see exercises for all your major muscles. Uh, there's uh, pictures as well as demos. So if you want chest exercises, there's a whole database there of different chest exercises. If you want leg, back, different exercises, you can go check that out. Oh, shit, I closed it out. All right. So I can open it up again. So the exercise database, all your major muscle groups. There's a section there on nutrition. You know, some, some of the basic fundamentals, uh, you know, how to count calories, how to track your macros and all that kind of stuff. It's a sample mass building bulking diet, sample fat loss cutting diet, 
And there's also some there suggestions there if you need some help with a customized program. Uh, that's available as well. There's a section for high protein recipes, you know, different recipes that you can uh, try out. Like there's a high protein oatmeal, high protein protein bars, protein pancakes, uh, different types of protein ice cream, protein muffins, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, and then in the click on the when you're in the app, click on the more tab down at the bottom. And there's a section there where you can ask Lee. And people like it's kind of like a private discussion within the app itself. So you can ask me questions and I'll respond to you within the app. Or if you got something that you want to discuss privately, uh, there's a contact Lee down in the bottom here, contact Lee. And let's wait for it to load. Contact Lee. So it's, it's a private thing where you can send me a private message if you have any questions that you don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to, to hear about, like if you got some specific questions or challenges about your workouts or nutrition, send me a question through the app. So I'm directing this to John. He said he has a copy of the app and he's getting in better shape, but he's not at his goal yet. If you need some help getting to your goal, send me a message through the app and we can chat about it and come up with some strategies that are right for you. So there you go, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video chat today. I enjoyed doing it as I always do. Uh, I have the replay of it up within the next 24 hours along with the timestamps. So if you want to go back and check out any of the previous questions and topics we covered, do that. And if you haven't already done so, download a copy of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app. I promise it'll be the best two bucks you ever spent. So there you go. Have yourself a great weekend. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Over and out.